a beautiful baby for me. Sure thing, Elsie. Let's go. You must have been a beautiful baby. Why, you must have been a wonderful child. When you were only starting to go to kindergarten, I'll bet you drove the little boys wild. And when it came to winning blue ribbons, you must have showed the other kids how. Why, I can see the judge's eyes as he handed you the prize. I bet you made the kids bow. Cause you must have been a beautiful baby. Cause baby, look at you now. Why, you must When you were only starting to go to kindergarten, I bet you drove the little boys wild. And when it came to winning blue ribbon, why I bet you showed why I can see the judge's eyes as he handed you the prize. Then she made the cutest bow. Cause you must have been a beautiful baby. Cause baby. on your mind. Heavens, what have you been doing, hijacking somebody? May I sit down? By all means. There you are. Now. Well, who from, how come, and what for? Tony Guido and Nick Cavelli. Mm, I smell trouble. Their gang just pulled a big job. The peacock robbery. It smells like one of their jobs. They keep me on the anxious seat, all right. Well, what do they want? A little party in the private apartment upstairs after the joint closes tonight. That's easy. It's for rent for such purposes. With a half dozen of our girls to entertain them, including Elsie. Mm, that's what I was expecting. And what I feared. There goes the big dough. With 300 more on the line on delivery of Elsie. 500 bucks gone with the wind. You know she won't go, so I... Because I want the place to make money. Why do you let her kid you? Well, you want us to kid ourselves? Nonsense. You're paying a handsome manager to look after such things, aren't you? It's 200 without her, 500 with her. $300 ought to be enough to get you to make that manager do his duty. 500 is almost enough to make me use a gun. But I don't think they could persuade that girl to go up to that apartment if they offered it ten times that much. It's amazing to me how you let that pair play you. If you had the right kind of manager, you'd soon see how quickly else he'd be persuaded to sit in on these parties. Darn it, why rub it in? The girl is 100% for the joint for what she's been hired for. No. I just can't tell any girl to do what I know isn't just right or get out. I'm a gangster, but I still haven't sunk that low. Rat. If you'll make my brother manager, I'll guarantee that Elsie Bellwood will be doing just what the joint wants her to do in ten days or... Nothing doing, Elizabeth. I beat up men. I'll never win for getting rough with a woman. Oh, Mr. Farina. Yes? Step here a minute, please. Get a load of that specialty. Some of these days, babe, you're gonna miss me, honey Some of these days, babe, you're gonna feel so lonely You're gonna miss my hugging You're gonna miss my kissing You're gonna miss me, baby When I'm gone away 
you're gonna feel so lonely, baby. Just follow me on him. For you know, baby, you done had your day. And if you leave me, you know you're gonna grieve me. You're gonna miss your little brown skin chocolate mama some of these. <laughs> you're gonna miss me. Mm. You're gonna miss me. You're gonna miss me. Ow. Watch it, boys. You're gonna miss your little bounce, can chop it up, mama, some of these. Day. A manager should be able to entertain in case you come up short of an act some night. You saw that. Think it over, Mr. Farina. As I started to say, Elsie's a good performer, and they like her. But she's too high hat. What do you mean, too high hat? Well, I mean that she should set in on some of these parties. Many of our customers are always asking her to. You understand, eh, had not? And? But is that just right? You know that not Elwood, she's a good performer. Pleases everybody with her singing and dancing. So don't you think that's quite enough? Of course, but the other girls go in for her, so why not her? That's her business. I hired her to do just what she's doing. If she wants... I couldn't stop her. But if she doesn't... I understand all that. But if we could promise some of them a date with Elsie... Say, many would be willing to spend more dough. As I said, that's up to Elsie. But you mustn't expect me to try to persuade her. And I hope, too, that the Poodle Dog Cafe hasn't sunk so low until a decent girl can't work here. Ah, uh, don't be so arbitrary, hard not. Many of the people who come here call themselves slumming. And if they want to date up a few of the girls for a little party afterwards, it means more dough for the joint. You understand? Of course I do, Farina. And they do it right along. But you were speaking about Miss Belwood. And I merely said that if she doesn't want to go out on any, I'm not going to argue and abuse her about it. Good evening, Mr. Grady. What's the matter? Oh, nothing much. I was just trying to show had not that if Elsie would consent to sit in on some of these parties, it would help the business. Of course it would. What did had not say about it? Uh, he said it was up to her. Well, he should make her. Who is she if she can't help us make more money? The other girls are always willing. That's what I try to show him. But all I could get is, it's up to her. I'll talk to Hadnett myself. Oh, Mr. Hadnett. Yes? Will you please step in here a moment? Of course. Have a seat. Cigarette? No, thanks. Mr. Hadnut, my cousin tells me you don't like the way we run our place. Yeah, Hadnut don't think that we ought to try to persuade Elsie to go out on parties if she don't want it. I said that I wouldn't try to... Now, this Elsie girl, she's very attractive. Some of our customers will sit in a little party now and then. You understand, after the place closes. Now, we like to oblige our customers. So we think that you should... Listen, Mr. Grady, your partner and I have just... Party is up to her. But I hired her to sing and dance here in the place, not to go out on private parties. Now, if you want to try to persuade her to, that's your business, but I won't. Oh, you won't, eh? Well, what do you think we got you hired for besides managing the place? We can do the managing. We... That is, you know the girls better than we do. You talk the same language. Now, we've been after this girl to help us out a long time. Now we say, you get her to all... Quit. That's okay by me. Now, now, had not. You don't have to do that. Let's talk it over. You see, I try you to get... You both made your positions very clear. There's no alternative but to do what you want me to or resign. I'm resigning. You can get plenty of men in my race to do anything you ask them to. So why waste your time on me? As far as Miss Bell was concerned, she's a lady. I have too much respect for her, for myself, to try to persuade her to do what you know and I know is wrong. As to you two, if you had any respect for the unfortunate members of my race, especially the girls who are forced to work here, you wouldn't try to make them do ugly things. But since you haven't, I don't like your attitude. I'm quitting. Good day. I was coming in to see Mr. Farina, and I couldn't help overhearing what was going on inside. What does he mean? It means that I'm leaving, Miss Bellwood. You leaving? But why? If you overheard much of the conversation, you ought to know. 
It's because of you. I'm sorry. But you mustn't. You can't. I won't let you give up your job on account of me. Now, I... The only way I could get it back and keep it would be for you to do what they wanted me to make you do. And if you did, I would hate both you and myself. Oh, you're so fine and noble. And jobs are scarce. I could never feel comfortable or happy knowing that you gave up yours because you wanted me to stay decent. Why, I... Oh, let's not take it so seriously. I don't belong in that place anyhow. Neither do I. If you just must quit, then I will too. You'll do nothing of the kind. There's nothing wrong with your job. And you don't have to change your ways just because some drunk and depraved customer wants to go flying around with you. Meantime, the customers like you. And you're making more money now than it is possible for you to make anywhere else. Forget about me and the cheap job I had. But don't you understand that? I... I understand all about what you want to say. But the fact is, I've been appointed to a job on the detective force. I was going to quit the first of the month anyhow. The prosecuting attorney is anxious to break up the cabaret racket. And their efforts to force you to be bad, whether you want to or not, should be a part of it. Anyway, I've got a better job. So go in there and do your work and keep on being nice. I like you that way. No, it isn't fame. You may think it's funny when I start to explain. Got no shoes on my feet, ain't got nothing to eat. But I've got a heart full of rhythm, not a dime to my name. But I'm rich just the same, for I've got a heart full of rhythm. Now when the skies are gray and everything's wrong, I find my way by singing a song that the great think I'm small. I laugh at them all, cause I've got a heart full of rhythm. Got no shoes on my feet, ain't got nothing to eat. But I've got a heart that's full of rhythm, not a dime to my name, but I'm rich just the same. For I've got a heart full of rhythm. very happy when I think of you being without your job on account of me, I... Tell you, Elsie, if I may call you that. You may, of course. Thanks. That makes it easier. Getting back to what we were talking about, I was trying to tell you that I didn't care. You see, I've been studying for detective work for two years. It comes under civil service. I took the examination. Thing is all right. I don't have to worry about a job for me any longer. With a better job, I can do more good. Naturally, I'm glad that I can now be more independent and stand up when the occasion rises for decent girls like you. I sure like you for that. And I shall always respect you. I hated to think that you had to suffer any inconvenience or embarrassment on my account. However, I like to think that the Negro race have such a terrible time. If we had a few more girls like you, maybe it wouldn't be as hard as it seems. By the way, did you happen to notice anyone hanging around to take my place? Yes, those Landry boys. Incidentally, distant relatives of mine. They're made to order for dirty work. They'd hardly stop at murder. So, I may have to quit after all. No, the customers like you too well. Just you stand pat, and they'll soon quit trying to persuade you. I hope you're right. It was bad enough for the help while you were there. But with those outfit like my relatives in charge? Why, well, shudder when I think what those poor girls will have to put up with now. Oh, 
you don't need to. I'm on the getting outside. I can be out in a jiffy and upstairs before you can get around on this side. I want to thank you for a fine evening. But if I find out that you're lying about that detective job, I'm going to make you let me do something that I never thought I'd ever do. Take care of a man. Are you asleep? You're playing possum on me tonight, Auntie. But why all the light? It'll hurt your eyes. you give up your job tonight to defend a girl's honor. A girl almost a stranger to you. But she's a good girl, Benny. And you stood up for her and believed in her at the price of your job. That's what I call a man. You're all right, Mr. Hadnot. I'd like to see some other colored man give up his job on account of any girl. Why, he'd throw at anybody that would show him 50 cents. I'm sorry to say... And then take her back for him. Hmm. Pretty rotten setup. But you, you're out of a job, Benny. You've got to live and get along until you find another one. Now, you may have this job that you mentioned. And you may have just said it to console me. But I'll find out. I've seen plenty of women taking care of men. Worthless, trifling, good-for-nothing men. And I've hated them for it. Isn't that funny? I want to take care of one now. You, Benny. But you're such a good man, Benny. But this is different. You've just got to be all right. I've just got to do this. I want to give you everything that I make and let you give me what you want me to have. Will you promise me you'll do this, dear? It'll make me so happy. That's strange. I wonder who could be calling at such an hour. Liz, what do you say we start the session with a little drink, yes? Who care about us, boss? <laughs> what can you want to talk to my aunt about at this hour? Please give me the message. She's a scandal. But if you say that it's a matter of life and death, I guess I'll have to call her. Oh, 
Oh, Auntie. Auntie, someone wants you over the phone. Do you hear me? Poor Auntie. You're tired. I just won't do it. Whoever it is has got to give me the message or wait until you wake up. home about 3 a.m. And what upon seeing your aunt laying as we discovered her that she was asleep? I thought she was asleep. When did you discover that she was dead, had been murdered? As I was finishing my bath, the phone rang. Yes? I left the bath and went to answer it. You answered the phone? I answered the phone. And? The person calling wanted to speak to my aunt. They insisted upon speaking to her. I asked them to give me the message. So, finally... When they insisted that it was a matter of life and death, I, I told them to hold the phone and I would go and call her. Then? Then I went to my aunt's room and called her. But she didn't awaken. She didn't awaken. Did you shake her? We usually do so when someone is hard to awaken. No, I didn't shake her. She was sleeping so peacefully that I decided that I would go back to the phone and insist upon them giving me the message. So you went back to the telephone and... Uh... I went back to the telephone, and I didn't get any response. The person calling had hung up. Had hung up? I tried and tried, but I couldn't get any answer. You're quite sure that no one answered? Positive. That aroused my curiosity. I began to feel suspicious. So, finally, I went back to my aunt's room and called her and shook her. And it was then that I discovered that, that she'd been shot. That, that she was dead. Well, what do you think of her story? Sounds truthful. It does and it may be. But in cases like these, one can never tell. It always pays to reserve decision until you learn more. That's true. Who is the girl? Her name is Elsa Bellwood. Do you know her? In a general way. I've talked with her. She's considered a very good singer and dancer and works at the Poodle Cabaret. I see. Do you know anything about her reputation, her character? She's in the show business, you know. This case seems to offer something. It is unusual. For instance, someone calls over the telephone. And insists upon talking to a woman you can see it who has been dead for hours. And time's a call when he knew the girl would have returned from her work and at such a late hour. If the girl is innocent in this murder, then someone who called knew something about who did it, if they did not kill her themselves. Now, if the girl killed her aunt, she would have had to leave the cabaret. I guess, uh, say, uh, between 10.30 p.m. and midnight. Go home, shoot her aunt while she was asleep, Go back to the cabaret, go on with her work, and then come back here in an hour and call the police station. It's too complicated for the arresting officer. There's only one thing to do. We'll have to take her downtown and hold her. I'm sorry. She seems like a very nice girl and truthful. But somebody killed that woman. 
Now, as the girl was the only one here, there's only one thing to do. Take her downtown and book her. Come on. Does this mean that, that I'm under arrest? I'm awful sorry, but you are. Oh. And, and it means that, that you're going to lock me up? Put me in jail? Yes. I'm awful sorry. Oh, I'm not blaming you. There's been a murder, and the law has got to find out who did it. Well, there's no one else to hold it this time but me. So... If you have an idea who did it... No, not the least. I, not the least. I, why, I can't imagine anyone wanting to kill my aunt. Poor aunt. <laughs> I, I was thinking of myself. I, I've never been arrested before. And, and now they're holding me for something that, that I don't know anything about. I'm under arrest, and they're going to put me in jail. Well, once if you're sure... I'm not sure of anything. I merely feel that the girl is innocent, and we should go easy on until we get some more evidence. Well, I'll speak to the matron. But you understand, she cannot leave, but at least the room isn't a cell. Thank you. I've talked to the... The matron has a room here with a bed in it, so we're going to let you have it so you can get some sleep. Then, when you're brought before the deer this afternoon, you'll be more rested and composed and think more clearly. You must be awful tired after such a night and all of this. Thanks. You're very kind. I am tired. Very tired. I feel... Oh, I guess I just don't feel anything anymore. I'll call the matron now. Uh, do you know a lawyer? Uh, have you some friends? I have no lawyer. I know a lot of people, but I'm, I'm afraid they won't understand this. I, I just don't know what to tell them. Do you have a boyfriend? No, I... A pretty girl like you? You must uh, have somebody you like or who like. Oh, I didn't say that I, I didn't know anybody. I know a man, but I don't... He would come closer to under than anybody else. If you have a pencil, I'll give you his name and address. Hello, Wanser. Hello, Adnott. Come in. Have a seat. Now, if Miss Bellwood didn't want to go on these private parties, you know what that means. I wouldn't make her go. Say, if I had my way, I'd clean up every cabaret like the food lock in this town. I stay so annoyed when I have to look upon other girls forced to put up with all they have to that it just makes my blood boil. Well, that was the trouble and why I lost my job. Miss Bellwood is a good girl. She's a good performer and the people like her. So I was thumbs down on making her do anything other than the work she had been hired to do for her to hold a job. So that's why I'm out of the poodle dog. That's too bad, Hadnot. But what about your appointment to the detective force? That's gone through. And I'm starting to work the first of the month. Good. I'll be glad to welcome you. Thanks. But getting back to the girl. Can you imagine her committing a murder? We couldn't even force her to go on a private party. I'm positive that she doesn't know anything about it. But this is the law, so you see what we are up against. Sure, I understand. Well, get your things on and come on down to the station with me and we'll see what we can do. Of course. I'll be ready in a few minutes. Come in. Oh, Elsie. Benny, I mean... Can you imagine such a terrible happening? And to you. Mr. Wanza brought me the news. I'm so sorry for you. Oh, yes. Mr. Wanza has been very kind. Let me thank you again, Mr. Wanza. I'm glad to have been of little help. I imagine you and the young lady would prefer to discuss this between yourselves. So you will please excuse me. Thanks. Now let's have a seat and you can tell me all about it. As I understand it, she had been dead several hours when you found her, after your arrival home. 
Oh, it was too terrible for words. Why, I walked about the house talking to her at intervals for about 15 minutes after I had and called, or maybe had called, to see if I had returned home. And when they found that I had and didn't know that she was dead, then that's the way it all ends. I can't even imagine beyond that. She was shot between 11 and 12 o'clock last night. Now, what time were you called? Between 3 and 4 a.m. Hmm. She must have been dead at least three hours before the girl, according to her story, discovered the body. Just about. You know, this case offers something. Here are two colored women living alone together. One finds the other mysteriously murdered. Now what? I've detailed Wanza to investigate it. That's sensible. Being a colored man, he might be able to find out things that one of our other officers could not. And I expect him to uncover something by this afternoon. Come in. Now tell Mr. Eckert, the district attorney, how you're related to Miss Bellwood and what you know about her aunt. Well, I don't know that I ought to. Go ahead, sister. Tell him all about it. Well, all we know about the murder is what we read in the morning papers. Of course, we know, um, that is, we knew the victim, Josephine Hawkins. In fact, she was a cousin of ours. Oh, you're a cousin. So you were related. All right, go on. And this Miss Bellwood was her niece and lived with her. That we have already found out. Miss Bellwood told us that when we went to her house this morning. Of course, I merely mentioned the fact so that you'd understand. Now, what did this Mrs. Hawkins do? How did she live? You mean Miss Hawkins? She wasn't married, had never been married. Oh. No, she owned a beauty parlor that she ran downstairs in the same building. Have you any knowledge or idea how the expenses of the apartment were shared? No, I don't know. But I do remember once talking to her and of her saying that she had an awful lot of insurance for a woman, but that Elsie, her niece, had taken it out on her and was paying the premiums. Mm, so she was heavily insured, and her niece, whom we are holding here, paid the premiums, even had the insurance taken out. That's what she told me. Mm, just when did she tell you that? Oh, three or four months ago, I'd say. That, of course, could be a motive for the murder. But we want to know more, Mrs. Green. The whole story, all you know. It's all right, Elizabeth. Go on, tell them all you know. Well, I... Now, just a minute. Come here. You keep telling her to talk. How about you doing some talking yourself? What are you ordering her to tell? What do you know? Well, you see... You see, I just got a job to manage the Poodle Dog Cafe last night. Oh, I see. You got a job to manage the Poodle Dog Cafe. And you got it last night. So what? Yes, he must tell all he knows. A murder has been committed, and the law must find the guilty persons. So tell all you know, if anything, about it. Well, we don't know anything much, mister. But you said the murder was committed between 11 and 12 o'clock last night. We were at the Poodle Dog Cafe from 9 o'clock last night, waiting to see Mr. Farina and Mr. Garotti about this job. At around 11 o'clock, I...
Gee whiz, I wonder when are those guys going to get around to me. We've been waiting here for two hours. I'm getting tired. Well, go on outside and catch some air. But we're going to keep on waiting until they send for you if it takes all night. All right, I'm going outside. I'll go along with you. What time is it, anyhow? Eight minutes to eleven. Now, how long are you going to stay out there in case they send for you? Oh, I don't know. Five or ten minutes. All right. I'll expect you back in ten minutes. Be sure you're back in ten minutes, however. And I hope you get back before they send for you. So do I. to get out of that stuffy place. Cigarette? Yeah. Oh, taxi! Drive me to 1415 Yandy Street, please. Quick! I sent my brother back inside and asked him to call me if I was sent for. It was pleasant outside, and I hung around half an hour. It was perhaps 25 or 30 minutes later when... It's great to see you now. Okay. When I entered Mr. Garrod and Farina's office, I happened to look up at the clock and remember that it was 11.35. Yes, sir? Bring Miss Bellwood to my office at once. Yes, sir. I thank you people for the information you have given me. I'll take your address, and if and when we need you, we'll send for you. You may go now. I sure hope you don't send for me. Oh, what an awful story. Why, I didn't leave the cabaret from the time I went to work until Mr. Hadnot picked me up and drove me home shortly after 2 o'clock that morning. Why has the man chose to lie like that? Perhaps he's trying to uh, seal the real murder. Would he have any motive for killing her himself? Oh, I don't know. The whole thing has become so confused until I can't think clearly anymore. But I can't see where he would have had any motive. And why are they trying to put it on me? These cousins of your aunt seem to have hated her, or you both. Can you prove that you didn't leave the place at the time he said you did? I'll try to. Now, let me think. I remember, after the first show... Or I should say, between shows, we always do two shows. I went to my dressing room and had a nap. I always do. If someone saw you go to your dressing room and could swear you stayed there until the second show, that would counter this evidence, which Landry will no doubt repeat when he's placed on the stand at the trial. That's it, Miss Bellwood. You took the words out of my mouth. I see. No, 
because I always lock myself in, and I don't recall seeing anybody when I went in or when I came out. That will make his statement about seeing you leave the place hard to disprove. But we've got to produce evidence to prove that he's lying. Give me false hope. Just leave me here to slowly succumb to this living death. I want to forget that I was ever born and that I ever had any hope and that I was ever a free person, once happy and hopeful. I can both understand and appreciate your hopelessness and despair, Elsie. But I want to tell you, dear, that I love you, have loved you long before you even knew it. And then I've dedicated my life to righting this great wrong and setting you free. Since you didn't kill your auntie, somebody else did. So you see, I must ultimately succeed. And I will succeed. Oh, what you say sounds so beautiful, Benny. But I'm only a convict now. And I shall always be pointed out as a convict. I... You're a victim of circumstances, Elsie. And you're not the first person to suffer this misfortune. When the guilty persons are brought to justice, you'll be a martyr. And no person can point a finger of guilt or scorn at you. I'm going to help you, dear. But you must help me to enable me to help you. Help you, Benny? How can I? Easily and simply. I believe Mrs. Green and her brothers either killed your aunt or hired somebody to do it. At least know who did. Either way, the truth is not before very long. Some Negro mixed up in this is going to talk. They always talk. And they can never keep a secret, especially one so important as a murder. Maybe. But why haven't they talked? They Don't know. you catch my point, dear. You had to be convicted first. They've kept so busy telling lies to put you here that they couldn't start talking up to now. But with you convicted and here in prison, they'll soon relax. They'll think they've been smart in putting you here and don't know enough to realize that you can be got now. Their first move now will be to try to get the insurance money. I'll bet. I'll be able to write you in less than a week because they've made an application for it. I love you, dear. You're my great incentive. Kiss me. Well, oh, how are you, Mr. Wanzett? Would you have a chair? Sit down here. You told me once that Mrs. Green's husband had been in love with your aunt many years before, back in the South. And he loved her dearly. And he was still in love with her when she was killed and would come to see her often. But he's disappeared. I haven't seen or heard of him since the night she was murdered. That's strange. I'm sorry you didn't tell me that before. I didn't think it was that important. Maybe he just went away and will come back some time. He may and he may not. Meantime, this might prove a connection. It might turn out to be the link that's missing. Maybe you'll find out something when you go to the city from uh, Reverend Bryson. He knew us all before we came from the South. Maybe you'll find out something from him about Mrs. Green's husband. Although it has been a long time since we came north. This looks like a lead. I'm going to follow it. I have a feeling we'll get somewhere. Now that this Elsa Bellwood has been convicted of murder and sent to prison for life, who will the company pay the money to? Oh, that will be decided by the court. In the meantime, this Green family, Elizabeth, John, and Clyde, have applied to it of next of kin. Oh, they have. So soon? Yes, I have the application papers here. You won't be paying them the money. Not until authorized by the court. And that will take considerable time. I'm glad to hear you say that. Did they give an impression when they filed the application that they understood it would be some time before the matter would be settled? Uh, since you've come to speak of it, I think that will be settled very shortly. Thank you. That is all I wanted to know. By that, you can see that they're counting on the money much sooner than it is even possible for the claims to be paid. This case isn't going to be long before something cracks. When this outfit finds that they can't lay hands on the money as quick as they had planned, 
Some of them are going to get impatient and drop something. And I'll be Johnny on the spot to pick it up and land all three of them in jail right quick. Well, I'm depending on you to keep checked up on them and help me get somewhere. I have a feeling that there's a story yet to tell. In the meantime, let's get over this Reverend Bison's and see what we can find out. You said something, brother. Be seated, gentlemen. You're nothing but a whiskey head and no good. We have liquor here to sell to customers, not to be soaked up by the manager. You stay drunk. Nobody likes you. So you're through. Now get out. Yes, I know everybody that's involved in this unfortunate affair. I knew Josephine Hawkins, and she was just a pretty young girl having bows for the first time. I knew Elizabeth Landry when she pulled the trick on Ned Green that made them man and wife. She says that she's going to have a baby and that I'm his father. Who are you? Uh, I... Well, uh, maybe I am and maybe I ain't. You know I ain't the only one that's been running around with her. I... Well, that's the chance you take, young man. She has you charged with fatherhood. There's no alternative. Uh, uh, what do you mean there's no alternative? Well, I mean that you must marry the girl. But I don't love her. Never did and never will. You know who my girl is. You know who I've been going around with. And I ain't afraid to tell you that I love Josephine Hawkins. She wouldn't come up with no tale like this. Why should she want me to marry her when she knows that I'm in love with her cousin? Well, that I don't know, young man. Now, you admit that you've been having clandestine affairs with that girl. She charges you with being the father of her unborn child. If you do not marry the girl, she'll have you arrested and put you in jail. You have a very good reputation, and you shouldn't permit either yourself or the girl to be scandalized. When you get ready for the ceremony, bring the girl here to me. Well, I married the couple. And three months later... She lied. She's no more to become a mother than you are. She tricked me into marrying her. The dirtiest trick a woman could pull on a man. That's why I came to you to find out what could be done by it. Well, you might ask for a doctor's examination. And if the examination proves what you say... I think the court would grant you an annulment. I, I, I don't want to wait that long. I can't be bothered with no nerves. I'm leaving town. I'm afraid if I stayed here, I'd kill her. I ain't got time to be bothered. I am leaving town tonight. Goodbye. Heartbroken, Josephine Hawkins had left town, gone north. And Elizabeth, after Green had left her... Uh, she left shortly afterward also for the north. And feeling that Green had followed Josephine, which perhaps he had, Elizabeth took her brothers, whose reputation was rather unsavory, north with her. Ten years later, I was transferred to my present charge. And when I came here, I learned that under the threat of death, Elizabeth's brothers had virtually forced Green to live with her. And in the meantime, Green's love for Josephine had never died. And he insisted upon seeing her whenever he had a chance. I think you have given us the key, Doctor, to the missing link in this tragedy. And we'll start from here and run this thing down. You can bet. Here we are, broke, strapped. It may be months before we get this money, if at all, and you must keep pouring liquor down your dirty throat until the Italians get disgusted with you and kick you out. Oh, you make me sick. Well, what do you expect? You planned this whole thing. For 20 years, I've been a slave to your design. Ever since the time you tricked Ned Green into marrying you, everything has been subordinated to your convenience. The only way I've been able to keep up is to keep pouring a lot of rotten liquor in me. 
And I couldn't quit drinking. No, because I had that cheap job at the Poodle Dog Cafe. And just as soon as you get this money, I'll go out of your life forever. And you won't never need be bothered with me again. I'm sick and tired of the whole thing. And I'll be glad when it's through and all over with. here until somebody comes out or goes in. I have a feeling we won't have to wait long. Hey, son, come here. Yes, sir? Live around here? Right across the street in that house with the yellow shade. How about the house next door? Mrs. Green lives there. Mrs. Green? Yes, sir, and her two brothers, John and Clyde. Nobody else? Well, her husband used to stay there, but he don't no more. He doesn't anymore. Why? I don't know. He just don't. He ain't been there in a long time. I think he went away somewhere. Anyway, he ain't there no more. But Mrs. Green's brothers, do they still live there? Oh, yes, sir. One of them's there now. He always is. They're going to be coming along soon. They eat about this time. And they're going to be coming along soon for his dinner. Which one's there now? John. He sleeps up until about this time. Then he gets up and eats. And then he goes down to the Maple Leaf Social Club. Maple Leaf Social Club, eh? Well, what time does he get back? He's never back before I go to bed, so I guess he gets back kind of late. Now, this brother John that you mentioned, does he work? They say he does. My papa says they gamble down there, and he does some... Thank you, son. Well, there's something for you. Oh, thank you, sir. Now, what time do you go to bed? About 9 o'clock, sir. About 9 o'clock. I see. How would you like to meet us, say, right here at 8 o'clock? We want you to carry a note. We'll give you another quarter. Oh, I'll be glad to, sir. Right here at 8 o'clock. Right here at 8 o'clock. But remember, don't tell anybody. We won't be able to meet you and give you that other quarter. Oh, I know how to keep my mouth shut. I'm studying to be a G-man. I won't tell nobody. Be sure that you don't. You can go now and meet us back here at 8 o'clock. At 8 o'clock? Don't tell nobody? i get you, mister. Goodbye. What's the idea, anyhow? I want to have a little talk with Brother John. A little private talk, and I need the boy to help me arrange it. Let's go down to Morrison now for a glass of beer, and I'll tell you the rest when we get there. Now, that's the way we'll work it. Sir, that's a clever plan to thought up all by yourself. Why didn't you think of it before? And why didn't Napoleon think of airplanes and howitzers? He could have really conquered your plan. <laughs> you go load the men into two cars and stop in the next block. They don't need to know what we're doing until we're doing it. I got you, Steve. Now, when I drive up, be sure and have your hand on your gun and be ready to get in the car and cover. Understand? I got you twice. Okay, now go in. All right, mister. Here I am. So I see. Johnny on the spot. Always be on time and you'll get somewhere by the time you become a man. Yes, sir. Say, do you know where the Maple Leaf Club is? Sure. I want you to show me that. So you drive up to the next corner, then you turn right, and there you are. All right, here it goes. That's the club there, mister. Yeah? Well, go in there and see this man, John, and tell him that his brother wants to see him down there right away. You understand? Yes, sir. When you bring him here, I'll give you the other quarter. Now, when he's sitting here by me, you come around on this side of the car, and I'll give it to you easy like. Yes, sir. Now, if you do just as I say and keep your mouth shut, it may be two quarters or half a dollar that I'll be giving you. Yes, sir. You can go now.
Hello, John. Well, hello, Hadnot. Ain't seen you in a long time. Been kind of busy since I left the poodle dog. Yeah. Say, where's my brother? You'll soon see, you contemptible liar. I just an excuse to get you out of here. I wanted to see you. What's the meaning of this? We try to hope somebody... All right, I got him covered. Say, what's the meaning of this, fellas? I ain't done nothing. What y'all gonna do with me? We're taking you for a little ride, and you won't be coming back. I ain't coming back? How come? Ever heard of Tolston Manor? You mean that handed house we out there on Tolston Point? Yeah. Who said that dude me? We're taking you there. For a little seance with the ghost of the manor. Not if I know anything about it. Oh, no, my good fellow. Not only are we taking you there, we are going to tie you up and leave you there to starve to death and die. You've been telling lies and have done an innocent person a great wrong. So we're going to take you up to meet the ghost of Tolson Manor and all his end ghosts, after which you die. Oh, oh bloody. Come on. Say, what's the matter? Come on, Mr. Right. What y'all going to do with me? I ain't done nothing. I... Get on it now. All right, Wanda, make a light, please. Ghosts, working by rope control. I hear that the only living things that visit here are huge buzzards with pink necks and white gills who fly down through the chimney and pick the bones of liars like John here whose lips have caused great suffering. They tie them to that post over there. And when the buzzards fly down and devour our bodies, old Tolston turn their soul into imp ghost. And every night at twelve... Great goodness, it's midnight now. When that hand reaches 12, the ghost I've heard appear. At the stroke of 12, now watch. Well, that settles it. The party over for a while, so we'll tie John up and leave him here and... Oh, please, man, please don't. Of course, if you care to do a little talking, tell us who killed Josephine Hawkins. We might decide to wait a while. If you promise them hands won't come back, I'll tell you anything, everything. Just don't leave me here. You're such a rotten, dirty liar until I hesitate to believe anything you say. You swore in court under oath, so how do you expect us to believe you out here? But I'll tell you why we brought you here and why we're going to leave you here with these ghosts. You killed Josephine Hawkins. I killed who? Josephine Hawkins. And you lied about Miss Bellwood when you swore she left the cabaret and went home and shot her aunt. I didn't, I didn't. What do you mean? I means I didn't lie about Miss Bellwood. So did my brother. But I didn't kill her aunt. Neither did my brother. I don't believe you. But we're going to tie you up and leave you here for the dirty lies you told on that poor innocent girl. We didn't kill her. I swear we didn't. But we did lie about seeing Miss Bellwood. And if you won't leave me here, I'll tell you all about it. Well, what do you think about it? Oh, I wouldn't believe this guy on a stack of Bibles. I don't see any use in wasting more time listening to this dirty liar. For if he'd lie enough to put an innocent girl into the penitentiary, we certainly can't afford to listen to him now. Please, man, won't you give me a chance? I didn't kill my cousin, but I did lie about it. I admit that, and if you promise you won't leave me here, I'll tell you all about how it was done. Shut up, you lying skunk. I don't think you say. Wait a minute. After all, we can listen to his story. And if we still don't believe it, we can tie him up and leave him here. Oh, well, if you insist. All right, you rascal. But the moment I'm convinced that you're lying, we're going to tie you up and leave you here. I thank you, mister. I ain't going to lie. You can keep me until you prove everything I says. All right. We're going to listen to your story. But we warn you that the moment it begins to sound fishy, it ends. And right here you stay. I'm going to tell you the whole story. And ain't one word I'm going to be a lie. All right. Start from the beginning. Way back in the south, before any of you came north. Yes, sir. 
I, I sure will. Well, it started like this. My sister Elizabeth took Ned Green to marry her. He was going with my cousin Josephine and was planning to marry her. But when Green learned the truth, he hauled off a letter and came north. Josie found out somehow Green was mad, so she hauled off a left too. My sister then followed Ned up north and brought me and my brother along with her. And lo and behold, she found Ned up here chasing around after Josie. That made her mad. So she had us go get him and scare him into living with her again. He tried to, poor fella, but he just couldn't get along somehow. You see, Ned was still in love with Josie and was always slipping out and seeing her. Then, just before the murder... You've made a slave out of me all of my life. Why don't you let me be and give me a divorce so I can go and marry Josie? You know I love Josie and have loved her always. We would have been happy if it hadn't been for your lying lips. I'll not let you alone. And I dare you to try to get a divorce. If you even as much as start to try, I'll have my brothers break your ugly neck. Same thing, year after year, the same thing. Well, you ain't never made me love you, and I ain't going to try no longer. I'm leaving you for good, and I'm going to Josie. And if she won't run away and live with me, I'll steal into the house some night and kill her. Shoot her in the head. Then kill myself. That's what I'm going to do. No dumb Negro like you ever had nerve enough to shoot anybody. And as for killing yourself, <laughs> you make me laugh. <laughs> but my sister was mistook in that time. For the very next night, uh, that was the night of the murder, when we returned home from the cavalry where we testified, we saw as leave, then come back. We found a note. Hey, sis, where's the bottle? What about a little drink? Oh, go chase yourself. You've had enough liquor tonight. Mm. Say, what's this? There's a letter. To my wife, I have done it. There is nothing to live for, so tonight I went to Josie's house and shot her through the head while she slept and turned on the light so her soul could find the way to heaven. With Josie dead, when you find this note, I will be dead too. I am going to tie a rock around my neck and jump off Tyndall's Bridge. If you care to bury me, you will find my body at the bottom of the river under the bridge. Unhappily, Ned. My sister then sat down and planned the rest. We knew exactly what time Elsie would come home. So she called up Cousin Josephine's house every ten minutes, starting at 2 a.m. She finally got Elsie. She could tell then that the girl didn't know her aunt was dead when she said, I'll go and call her. And when she did, Lizzie hung up on her. She knew then that Elsie would find out that her aunt was dead, had been killed. Lizzie stayed up all night long, making up that lie about Miss Elsie leaving the cabaret and coming back. So as to make it look like Elsie did it. Then she rehearsed me and Clyde on how to tell it. We were scared they would mix us up. All the time we was at the district attorney's office, Lizzie kept on pitching me and Clyde to make us tell it like she rehearsed it. You see, she was after that chance money. And she figured that if she could get Elsie convicted, why, she'd get it. Well, what do you think of it? Oh, I guess we'll put him under arrest while we check on his story. And if we find Green's body... And that'll reopen the case and set Miss Bellwood free. All right, fella. We're calling the party off. Taking you back to town and locking you up. Until we can see if your story is true. 
Let's get going. Giving them to me? Well, what do you mean? Just what I say. They're yours, then, my darling husband. But I don't... Well, I'll explain. To begin with, I wouldn't have had them at all if you hadn't dedicated your life to the solution of the crime, which set me free. And next, for some strange reason, when I thought that you had lost your job on my account, I developed a maid to give you my money to take care of you if need be. Until you got another job. Then suddenly, all I had been through began to happen. You saved me, you loved me, and you married me. And I love you. Now, after all this, if you want to make me happy, please take these checks. $15,000 worth. And do whatever you want to do with it. Will you promise me, dear? Such a peculiar request. Such a strange desire. But since you insist on making me a sort of guardian, I'll take the checks and establish a trust fund for our children here. That'd be all right. <laughs> 